really okay. So, thank you for being here and uh, for so generously giving us your time, for giving us our annual guest lecture. It's been a real honor for us. And I just want to um, seek your opinion on an issue that is going to be very important for us in the, in the year to come. As I mentioned to you earlier, you and you will be chairing the Global Migration Group uh, at a time in 2017 when uh, the UN system has already begun work towards two global compacts, one on responsibility sharing for refugees and another on safe, orderly and regular migration. And at the same time, the UN has launched a global campaign against xenophobia. So I have a couple of questions that I'd like to put to you and they specifically touch on the question of xenophobia. And um, I think the, the, the search is also for ways of addressing it. And in order to do so, I wondered if you could perhaps um, comment on what might be some of the root causes, what might be the triggers for xenophobia, what makes us xenophobic as human beings? Well, partly it's uh, trying to maintain a familiarity and homogeneity of uh, communities which are part of our lives. Uh, that's an understandable and respectable position. Uh, partly it's a concern for maintaining privilege, mm -hmm. uh, which is, takes many, many forms, xenophobia, mm -hmm. patriarchy, uh, 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 racism, mm -hmm. uh, lots of possibilities, it's not so attractive. Uh, and uh, it, it, there are specific uh, forms in, in particular places, like in the United States, say, uh, one significant fact is that the white population, which of course has always been totally dominant, that's us, the rest are others, uh, is becoming a minority. Mm. And uh, within about maybe a decade or 15 years, uh, uh, it'll be literally a mi minority, the mm. workforce, within a couple of decades, a minority, the population. Uh, this is combined with an attack on cultural values which have offered a kind of uh, a sense of uh, a sense of place a sense of superiority a sense of uh, uh, having some significance in the world uh, uh, which is being challenged in many ways uh, by the feminist movement by the gay movement by uh, immigrants by anything uh, and uh, 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 the United States happens to be a very religious community, so uh, the sense that others have contempt for our religious values, our churches, the center of our lives, that all combines. And it's easy to blame uh, those out there who we don't know anyway, and what are they doing here, and that can turn into xenophobia. In other places like, say, Denmark, uh, where the society has been in, traditionally quite homogeneous, mm -hmm. uh, the just the beginning of some indication of some change and uh, a threat to the uniformity and what we're used to and what we expect uh, it tends to raise uh, uh, feelings of hostility and, uh, and barriers to protect what we think is being challenged. Uh, sometimes it can take really extreme forms. I mean, there are uh, states in the United States where literally uh, there are, uh, there's legislation proposed to uh, bar Sharia law, which is about as likely as happening as um, you know a comet hitting the earth or something. But you have to protect yourself against it. And uh, this often takes very strange forms, even at, in elite circles. Mm. So for example, if you read uh, uh, top planning documents, secret documents of the government written by the most uh, sophisticated elite uh, liberal intellectuals, uh, Dean Ashes and Paul Nitze, others, uh, the uh, paranoia is almost indescribable. Uh, the, uh, 
the Russians are taking over the world, we can barely defend ourselves, uh, we have to arm to the teeth because of this onslaught against the slave state. Uh, the rhetoric is uh, hair-raising, you know, and this is elite, intellectual, cultivated people talking to each other. You, know. uh, you find the same thing if you read something like uh, the famous Powell Memorandum, which was written by uh, a mm -hmm. corporate lawyer, became a Supreme Court Justice, uh, Justice Powell. It was about the takeover of the whole country by the Marxist left, the students on the rampaging, uh, the media all taken over by the Marxist left, the on and on with crazed paranoia uh, because something was changing, total control was disappearing. Another form of this is xenophobia. Mm -hmm. It uh, has many manifestations and it's, uh, these are part of human nature, mm -hmm. right? not an attractive part, mm -hmm. but uh, they can have many sources and they're hard to deal with. I come from Britain and um, you know, we've just had the, the Brexit vote that is affecting the whole social and political landscape of Britain very deeply in a very profound way and in ways that many of the people who were voting were not aware. And, and indeed there are some who would say that many voted to leave based on information received from the tabloid press. So that leads me to, to sort of ask you about the role of the media in understanding, you know, how can we address uh, the ways in which the media represents migration and how, how can we redress that imbalance as well when it's happening? Well, unfortunately, uh, parts of the media are committed to force fostering these uh, values and uh, even magnifying them. Uh, there are, uh, uh, the, the only way to address the media, I think, is to address the general culture of which the media is some kind of reflection. And uh, it's um, necessary to begin with uh, uh, instilling values of tolerance, uh, understanding, uh, sympathy, uh, support for others, uh, recognition of how others have supported us. Uh, uh, again, take, uh, say, an immigrant community like, take, say, the United States, where everyone is an immigrant. Uh, so uh, everyone's grandfather or great-grandfather was fleeing from persecution somewhere, and they were brought in, oppressed, uh, discriminated against, uh, finally integrated somehow. The sense that we're all part of this, uh, this is part of being human, is being accepted in uh, communities where maybe you seem strange, so we have to be understand others in our midst. Uh, every country has some story like that. The, the UN system has been talking and thinking quite a bit around migration and one of the repeated phrases that I've been hearing is um, that of we need to change the narrative, we meaning policy makers. So I, I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts, any recommendations around policy making on migration that you know, would, would help us change the narrative or how can we change this narrative? In other well, words. Well, my feeling, as I've tried to indicate in these talks, is that a crucial thing that privileged Westerners should understand is that they are the beneficiaries of the repression and persecution from which people are fleeing. Uh, they're fleeing in certain directions, not others. Mm -hmm. From Africa to Europe, not from Europe to Africa. There's reasons for that from Iraq uh, to the West and not from the West to Iraq. And uh, it's not just a matter of things that we or our predecessors have done, but what created the wealth and privilege that we now enjoy. It wasn't just won by sweat of the brow. It was won by exploiting mm -hmm. and repressing mm -hmm. others, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in hideous ways. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's not too well known in the West is that uh, the Western 
uh, industrial revolution, the, the economic development that brought us wealth and privilege was based on the most vicious system of uh, slavery and uh, that ever existed. Mm -hmm. Sl slavery existed for a long time, but it mm -hmm. reached its peak of uh, viciousness and uh, uh, hair-raising brutality in the plantation economies of the southern United States, which uh, created the cotton exports. Cotton was the kind of like the oil of the 19th century that are the basis for the manufacturing, uh, finance, uh, commerce, uh, trade, uh, uh, retail industries. It's, uh, and we're rich and privileged thanks to that, plus, of course, extermination of the indigenous population. And there are similar things elsewhere. France is a rich country in part because of its uh, monstrous behavior in Haiti, which began with the Spanish wiping out the population and the French bringing in slaves and a horrible story right almost to the present. Uh, these are uh, uh, the same is true of I mean, West Africa probably could have developed the way Japan did if it had not been colonized. Japan was, wasn't what developed. West Africa was, couldn't develop. Uh, this runs all through the world. I mean, Egypt and the United States, believe it or not, were in pretty similar situations around the early 19th century. Uh, they both had uh, rich agriculture, uh, producing both cot major cotton producers. Uh, uh, they each had a kind of an a, a government, different kinds of governments, but both committed to industrial policy development. Uh, the, uh, Mehmed Ali in, in Egypt, uh, the Hamiltonian system in the United States. Uh, uh, the fundamental difference is that the U.S. was free to reject the colonial imperial policies of the then master of the world, uh, England. Egypt was not. Mm -hmm. uh, England and France simply committed themselves openly to prevent any industrial development in that region. Egypt is Egypt, the United States is the United States. Uh, this, uh, it's not simply a matter of recording the crimes of the past, but recognizing that our privilege and power right now depends on a long history yeah. of creating conditions from which people are now fleeing. Uh, this is going to become quite extreme in the coming years. Yeah. Uh, the uh, effects of uh, global warming, which is the basis of our privilege, it's the, it's the result of the Industrial Revolution, which made us rich and powerful. Yeah. Uh, that's now threatening the lives it's a, at a severe level at the level of tens and hundreds of millions of people who were the victims of these processes and were uh, repressed and often destroyed, destroyed in the course of uh, creating our privilege. So when the uh, minister, environmental minister of Bangladesh says that uh, you, the rich countries, created the conditions from which tens of millions of Bengalis are going to have to flee because of rising sea levels, you at least have the responsibility of welcoming them in. You can't do anything about what you did to them, but at least face the, the consequences of what you've done and what you benefit from. The reason you're rich and able to accommodate them is the reason why they're fleeing. I think that sensibility and understanding has to be brought to the population of the rich and wealthy countries. It's not a matter of, well, I didn't do it, my grandfather did, so why should I be blamed? But you benefit from it. That's why you're rich and powerful. That's why they're fleeing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's been a, a privilege and a great pleasure to, to, to listen to you, to learn from you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here.